Hey there, welcome to webinar number seven here at the B78 Endurance Hub. If you haven't had a chance to check out our sixth webinar, you should do that first uh, before you watch this one because really it's going to lay the foundation for uh, this topic, which is zones. Uh, now, you don't 100% need to do that. Uh, this, this talk is actually staying on uh, this more simplified version of things, but really my goal here is to uh, kind of go through the different zones that you may see uh, in your training. Uh, certainly if you're working with a coach uh, or you're getting an online program, they're either going to uh, structure your training using uh, different zones, uh, but I think it's important to have a little bit more foundation than that and understand how we get there. So webinar number six, the one that uh, is before this, uh, is understanding those thresholds and basically is going to give you a little bit more knowledge on how we actually get to uh, establishing zones. For today, however, uh, let's dive in and talk about uh, different zones. get this little slideshow up here. Hopefully everybody can see that. <clears throat> so this, this talk is called measuring effort and zones. Uh, they're, they're basically the same thing. Uh, I like talking about measuring effort, uh, because I think sometimes people forget that that's what zones are for. Zones are a way to put us in a specific type of effort. Um, so let's dive in here. Uh, so zones are an effort range that help establish training parameters. And that's the most important thing because really what we want to do is make sure that training is targeted and specific and has a goal. Uh, you know, there's an outcome for each workout and by having zones or playing around, uh, in and around the different thresholds that we establish, hopefully from some kind of a test, uh, that allows us to be just more deliberate and more on target with our training. Uh, I think too often people will go out and just get into this sort of boring, mundane, same old pace that they do all the time. Uh, they're not really uh, specifically doing anything when they go out. Uh, you know, often people will default to this sort of weird middle ground where it kind of feels hard, but it's not so hard that you can't keep going um, rather than being really deliberate and specific around what they're what they're trying to do. So how are zones established? Now, again, if you haven't seen webinar number six, you should jump in there and have a look because we talk about thresholds and really that is the way that we establish zones. There should be something that you're measuring that you're working backwards from to establish certain training zones. So testing is, uh, you know, the number one way that we establish zones. Uh, perceived effort is really important. Now, you're going to hear, hear me talk a lot about perceived effort. Uh, we have become so dependent on technology that often uh, people forget what something's actually supposed to feel like. You know, it wasn't so long ago that we didn't have any measuring tools. So we would go out. Uh, for a workout and we'd say, okay, well, this workout's supposed to be hard or this supposed workout's supposed to be your 10K pace or your 5K pace or whatever you were trying to do. And so we had a, a pretty keen uh, feeling for what certain things were supposed to feel like. Now we rely so much on technology. I think sometimes people forget, oh, I should maybe tune in to what this actually feels like. And it's important for the most practical reason that if you're in a race and you're depending on your technology to tell you how hard to go, uh, and now that technology fails in some way, whether it's a battery dies or it's not picking up a signal or whatever, uh, this can be very frustrating. But if you have the confidence to know how something is supposed to feel, then that's, that's really great. So you'll hear different types of testing, uh, a VO2 max test, for example, if you've ever done one or if, if you've heard of that is basically a way it, they're usually progressive in that they start you off fairly easy. And then every few minutes they're ramping up the intensity, whether it's through speed on a treadmill or incline on a treadmill, or they're increasing the wattage on a, on the bike. Um, and they're trying to get you to what we call VO2 max, which is the place where you're utilizing as much oxygen as you possibly can in your current human body. Um, so that would be a VO2 max test. Um, an FTP test, uh, if you're getting into triathlon or you've been into biking for a long time, uh, 
this is a very simple test that you can do as long as you have uh, some something to measure wattage, whether it's a smart trainer or a power meter on your bike. Uh, and an FTP test, there's a couple different protocols. The most common one that people have used for years is a 20 minute test where you do uh, a 20 minute effort, basically as hard as you can go for 20 minutes. Uh, in that the parameter is like, don't go out in the first two minutes so hard that the next 18 are just useless. You have to be pretty steady across that 20 minutes. Usually they recommend that you're, you know, steady in the first 10 to 15, and then you give everything you've got in the last five. And from there, uh, we can derive what's called an FTP number, your functional threshold power. That's what FTP stands for. Um, and this is the estimated wattage that you would be able to sustain, to sustain for one full hour. Uh, and if it's a 20 minute test that you're doing, usually they'll take about 95% of that and call that your functional threshold power. One of the testing protocols that uh, I've been using for years is called uh, the Inside Protocol. Now, Inside is a really interesting company uh, developed by uh, a guy in Europe. Uh, he's worked with all kinds of cycling teams. Uh, he's worked with very, very high-end triathletes. And he's basically developed this uh, testing protocol where they test everything from a 20-second max effort up to a 12-minute sustained effort, which would be more like that FTP test. So they do the 20 second test, they do a three minute test, they do a six minute test and a 12 minute test. And each of those tests is, is, is targeting something a little bit different. And we've come so far in our understanding of uh, testing and thresholds and we have so much data now that uh, this particular platform has actually developed uh, um, an algorithm that will sort of figure everything out. And they have a very robust uh, zone breakdown that they give you. Uh, it's really, really impressive. Um, they also are able to correlate uh, specific wattages with carbohydrate demand, which is really useful for long distance events. Um, so if you ever see inside testing, uh, that's a general look at what that is. Um, a lactate test uh, in its purest sense um, is one where they're actually taking blood. So usually they're pricking your finger. Uh, at different workloads, so different intensities, and they're looking at how much lactate is in your blood. And what they'll find is as, as intensity increases, the amount of lactate also increases. And eventually you will go past a threshold, but they will call your lactate threshold, beyond which uh, the, the amount of lactate accumulating in your blood goes up exponentially. Um, and so that's been a very popular test over the years to establish, hey, beyond this point, it's, it's unsustainable, but up to this point, maybe it's sustainable for certain, certain amounts of time. Um, you may hear the word field test, and basically that just means that you're out in the quote field. So maybe you're gonna go to the track and you're gonna run you know, a mile as hard as you can, and from there, they're gonna you know, find some numbers. Now they should be tracking something. They should be tracking pace or heart rate, uh, if you go out on the bike, maybe to the velodrome or a flat piece of road and you do a 40K time trial or a one hour time trial, that might be a really pure way to find your functional threshold power, um, like what you actually can do for an hour. And then we can work backwards from there and establish uh, specific zones. So lots of different ways to get to your zones, but the point here is there should be some kind of testing uh, that you're doing that's establishing uh, uh, thresholds in some way so that we can work backwards from there and establish your zones. So how do we measure effort? Well, there's lots of different ways to measure effort. Obviously it depends on the sport you're doing. Um, you know, we'll talk about a few of these and I'll, I'll relate them to the different sports for the sake of this conversation. You know, we're, we're talking about swim, bike and run mainly. Um, and there's some crossover as well. So the first one that you always need to be paying attention to is the rate of perceived exertion or RPE. Sometimes it's, it's uh, shortened to, and this is, how does it feel? And, you know, usually we just use a very simple, you know, one out of 10 scale where 10 is as hard as I can go. And one is like, I'm barely moving, uh, or as a percentage, you know, I'm going 60%, 70%. 90%, 100%, uh, you cannot go harder than 100%, <laughs> despite the fact that you might want to give it 110%, <laughs> you can only go 
it's still fun to say you're going 110% though. Um, anyway, so rate of per perceived exertion, very important. Heart rate is one of the oldest metrics that we use because it was, you know, one of the easiest to measure. Like we came out with heart rate monitors, uh, you know, a few decades ago. And it was really revolutionary in terms of how we measure effort. We suddenly had this way to constantly monitor what our heart rate was. Preceding that, we used to just stick our fingers uh, on our uh, carotid artery and take our pulse for 10 seconds and multiply by six. Uh, I still do that because I'm old school. Uh, I don't run with a smartwatch, uh, mostly because I don't want to know how fast I'm not running uh, in my retirement years. Uh, but occasionally I'll do hard workouts and I will take a little pulse thing the way I used to 30 years ago uh, and just make sure that I'm in in the right place. Uh, and I like that. It keeps it really simple. Uh, you know, all of the athletes we coach now have smart devices and I would encourage that because it's, you know, there's great metrics, but also encourage you to, you know, learn some of the simpler ways that we can get to the same, the same uh, numbers. Pace is a great way to measure effort. Uh, one of the complications with pace is that, let's say you're on a bike, you're on a flat road, and you're you're trying to get a, a handle on how fast can I ride for one hour. Well, you know, it might be slightly uphill, it might be a bumpy road, it might be a screaming headwind in one direction and a tailwind in the other. So pace can be a little bit misleading. In order for pace to be a really good way to measure effort, uh, you have to be able to control the external environment really well. So uh, in swimming, for example, uh, pace is actually really great, especially obviously in a pool because the conditions more or less are always the same. I mean, there might be te temperature variations in the pool. There's certain pools that are uh, what we call faster than other pools. And that's basically how, you know, the water moves in that, in that pool. Um, I, my belief is that, you know, for really high end events like the Olympics, the pools are, are, have to be standard in terms of their depth and the way they're built so that it's consistent from year to year. Um, but really in the pool, we will get, uh, we will do pace tests a lot. So we might do a timed 400 that will give you, uh, you know, wh whatever time that was. And from there we can derive, uh, you know, how the, the work sets in a, in a swim situation should happen. So pace is actually something we use a lot in the, in the water, but less so, uh, you know, out in biking and running. And that's because the outside or external world is, uh, unpredictable. Now, you know, if you're on a track, uh, it pace is great because we're controlling lots of things. It's flat and, you know, unless it's a super windy day, if the air is pretty still, then it's pretty consistent. Uh, if you're on a treadmill, certainly we use pace a lot because again, uh, we can control the environment, uh, to a large degree. Um, power on the bike is just a, a, such a wonderful way to measure effort. Um, power does not care if it's, you know, hot or cold or uphill or downhill power is power. You know, how hard are you pushing on the pedals and how fast are you spinning those pedals around and you will have a power number. Power is very, very uh, it, real and, you know, in the moment. And by that, I mean, you know, you might be pedaling uphill, pedaling at 300 watts, and then if you stop pedaling, you will go to zero immediately. Uh, whereas something like your heart rate uh, doesn't drop. There's like a lag time between, you know, that really hard effort and then it, it, it comes down a little bit. Likewise, on the way up, you know, in the first 10, 20 seconds of a hard effort uh, running or biking, uh, the heart rate takes a little bit of time to get there. Whereas power, uh, is very pure. It's, it's very in the moment and it's a great tool. Uh, if you're a beginner, uh, in cycling or triathlon, I certainly don't recommend that you run out and buy a power meter. Um, but as you get a little more stuck into it and more interested in the numbers, uh, and certainly if your budget allows, uh, power is a great, a, a great tool to have on your bike. And we've come a long way, uh, in, in the power meter industry and in the smart trainer industry, there's been a lot of innovation um, and there's been more competition, which has made uh, the prices of these things come down a lot. The first power meter I ever purchased was in 2001 and it cost me three and a half thousand dollars. And that was a lot of money. Um, and now I think, you know, you probably get in the market for 500 to a thousand bucks um, for a good power meter.
Um, lactate accumulation. So this is another way to measure effort, uh, but a little unrealistic because it requires actually taking blood uh, and and looking at it. So if you're a high end uh, Olympic athlete at an Olympic training center, this may be very well something that you're doing on the regular uh, is is actually doing you know lactate testing, say on deck at the pool or at the track where you're you're actually looking at how much lactate is being produced. Uh, so maybe realistic at the very, very high end of sports, but less so realistic um, at the low end. And really, you should have somebody who, who knows what they're doing if you're going to go that route. Um, and then breathing rate. You know, this sort of maybe falls into rate of perceived exertion, but certainly, you know, you can tell how hard you're going. If, if, if your breathing rate's high and you're, you can't talk anymore, it, it probably means you're going harder. Um, so those are a few ways to measure effort, uh, in different sports, we might have, uh, different ways to measure effort. Like for example, weightlifting or strength training or, or power lifting, uh, you may be measuring it, you know, based on how much weight is on the bar. Uh, that's another way to measure what's going on. So, but for the sake of endurance sports, those are the most common. So establishing zones, uh, again, repeating myself a little bit, but we're testing for specific thresholds. That's what we want to do first, and then often we work backwards. Uh, and there's various formulas, and there's different ways to get the different zones. If you are using a platform like Training Peaks and you're entering your zones in the back end, uh, you're going to find all these different, uh, you know, ways that you can set up your zones. And some will have four zones, and some will have five zones, and some will have eight zones, and it can get a little confusing. Uh, and that is, you know, unless you know what you're looking at, you can be a bit overwhelmed by that. Um, what I would like to suggest is always start with trying to find, you know, one or more of the thresholds. So again, the, the easiest is always that FTP test. Lots of protocols online. Training Peaks has, uh, you know, a, a great protocol. They, they have a great resource center. That would be a good place to start. Um, but you want to establish a zone and then work backwards from there. And, you know, there's lots of different uh, ways to get to different zones. You kind of have to just find the one you like or you'll have a coach that, you know, prefers it to do it a certain way. Uh, I don't think there's right or wrong answers. I mean, obviously, there's some that are better than others. Uh, the more important thing is that it's consistent and that you know, you know, if you know what each zone is supposed to be doing uh, so that your training has a purpose and it's not just aimless. So I'm going to run you through like the most typical zones that I use and I try and keep it, you know, really simple. Uh, I think I've got six zones in here uh, and six even seems a little high. I added that sixth one more as an example of what happens when intensity gets really high. Um, but typically zone one that you'll see out there is the recovery zone. Now I'm going to asterisk this whole talk by saying that I actually, as a coach, am rarely uh, giving people specific zones to use. I don't really ever say zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four. I like to, uh, I'd still have zones set up, but I like to be more specific around certain thresholds. So if I give somebody an interval workout, for example, I won't say like zone four or zone five, because sometimes the range that's set up is quite large. And so I like to hone in a little bit more specifically on the heart rate or the wattage or the pace that I want this person to do. Um, because sometimes the, the zone ranges that are, you know, produced by some of these formulas are just, are large. And I like to dial in a little more specifically. Again, that's just a personal preference as a coach. Uh, it doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just the way that I do things, but I'm still referencing different zones. So anyway, uh, zone one, so recovery, uh, roughly zero to 60% of of VO2 max, that's a good way to think of it, or three to five out of 10 on the perceived uh, rate of perceived exertion scale. Pretty simple. If you're in recovery zone, uh, it should feel very, very easy. Zone two, uh, we often call this the endurance zone. Uh, you can think of this about 65 to 75% of VO2 max or a six to seven out of 10 on the rate of perceived exertion scale. This also falls in and around the, your first ventilatory threshold or your aerobic threshold. So sometimes zone two training is, is not sometimes, but 
uh, often that's like where you want to hang out is around that first threshold. So I keep talking about thresholds because uh, to me, that's more of an indicator of where we want to be. But zone two usually falls in and around here. And it's a really, really important part of the endurance puzzle. Um, you know, often we uh, err towards doing always hard work, right? Like work at threshold or above threshold or VO2 max workouts. Like those are sort of the the workouts that people emphasize the most and maybe feel the best about because they, they're working hard and it feels good to work hard. But make no mistake, uh, you have to do a ton of work down in this endurance zone. Uh, it will ultimately make you better uh, at the higher zones as well. There's lots of amazing physiological things that happen down here that are super, super valuable. And if you neglect doing work down here, uh, you just will not reach uh, your potential. Uh, you have to do work down here if you want to be an endurance athlete. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. So zone three, sometimes it's called tempo. I, I actually rarely use the word tempo, but I wanted to throw in a term there that you might see. This is sort of this kind of weird zone that's in between the two thresholds. So again, if you, if you haven't watched webinar six, you should go back and look at it. Uh, zone three, the way I set up zones is like kind of in the middle. And it's like this kind of awkward zone. And sometimes people call this no man's land, like they don't really like training here, but I actually disagree. There's some really good stuff you can do in zone three and some of the longer endurance events will, will you'll end up here. Uh, so if you're doing a half Ironman or an Ironman, like this is kind of where you're hanging out. Uh, it's a bit of an awkward space because it's not clearly happening at either of the zone, like either of the thresholds, like that first ventilatory or aerobic threshold or your anaerobic threshold. But for long distance events, like you're just likely where you're going to end up. So you have to know what this feels like and, and get good here if you're training for that specific event. So maybe 75 to 80% of VO2 max, seven to eight out of 10 on the rate of perceived exertion scale between first and second ventilatory threshold or between the aerobic and anaerobic thresholds. The best way to think of this zone. So zone four, uh, the, at least the way I set it up, this happens in and around that second threshold. So again, that second threshold, anaerobic threshold, lactate threshold, not all the same thing, but kind of similar. Uh, so you can think of this about 80 to 90% of VO2 max. Uh, this is sustainable, but not forever. I mean, if you're going to do like a, maybe a, a 10 K running race, you're here or a little bit higher half marathon here, certainly Olympic distance triathlon, like you can hang out in and around, uh, you know, this zone four, which is in and around that second threshold and get away with it about eight to nine out of 10 on the rate of perceived exertion scale. And lots of really great work can happen in and around this threshold. So, you know, above this threshold, unsustainable for any real length of time. And certainly the further you move above this threshold, it becomes less and less sustainable. Just below this threshold, you can, you can sustain it for surprisingly uh, long amount of time. But, you know, little things like your demand for carbohydrate will really, really be dramatically increased here. So it, you, it's a finite amount of time that you can spend here, but you can get really good at spending a lot of time here. So uh, threshold, you know, this zone typically happens in and around that second threshold. So if you're using wattage as an example, like, you know, if you know your lactate threshold wattage or your, uh, you know, your FTP wattage, uh, that usually that's going to happen in or around zone four. So zone five, as I like to describe, is like the VO2 max zone. So we've moved past that threshold. And uh, as we move further and further past or further and further above intensity wise, it becomes less and less sustainable. So a typical set here might be like five by three minutes of something. And I want you above that threshold. So this is like a nine to 10 on the rate of perceived exertion scale. Um, and this is, we're getting into, into VO2 max territory. Now I want to be careful. I'm saying hundred percent of VO2 max, uh, some of my earlier comments are, are that VO2 max is in the previous webinar is that VO2 max is a flux rate. So it's not a fixed rate. It's not, you know, you will reach VO2 max at uh, different amounts of time at different intensity. So the higher the intensity, the quicker you'll reach it, the lower the intensity kind of above this threshold, the longer it will take you to reach it. So 
that's a little misleading that comment, but basically this zone five, as I describe it, is getting into VL2 max territory. Now, as mentioned, I threw in uh, one other zone here, and this was more as a reference, not something that we do a lot of in endurance sports, but this is basically anaerobic. Uh, so again, 100% of VL2 max, a little misleading because now as we get into anaerobic, we're, we're not really dependent on oxygen except for the recovery part, which is a whole other discussion. Um, but just for the sake of this, so this would be like a 10 out of 10 on the rate of perceived exertion. Uh, and this is well above your anaerobic threshold. This is something like I'm going to do, you know, some sprints. So 20 meter sprints, or I'm going to do, uh, you know, strength training often falls into this category. If the reps are sort of three to five reps or something, um, you know, we're in anaerobic territory, which a nice tidy way to think of it is like, can I do the exercise and hold my breath? Well, yeah, for most of that stuff you can also a bit misleading because we always need aerobic pathways to recover from that work anyway. So the, the best way to think of that is, okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to do like a 30 meter sprint on the track and hold my breath just to prove that it's an anaerobic activity. But I can, I can promise you that in the time, you know, the minute or two after you do that, you'll be breathing quite heavily to recover from that effort. So, um, the work itself might not require oxygen, but the recovery from it will. Um, anyway, zone six, rarely something that I'm ever telling people to do, but I wanted to use it as a reference. So you had it. So there you go. Real simple. Uh, you know, that's basically how zones are set up again, depend on the coach that you're working with or the program that you have, uh, might look a little different and that's okay. Uh, as long as it's always referencing back to, Hey, this is a threshold we established. And from there we've broken out these different zones. And so when we do a workout, if, if you're in zone two, I want you there because we're trying to accomplish this. Or if, if you're in zone four, I want you here because we're trying to accomplish this specific goal. Uh, knowledge is power. And I think it's important to know, like, yes, you might have zones, but why? And, and it's good to know. Cool. Thank you for joining us and uh, looking forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Take care, everybody.